On February 7, 1984, Astronaut Bruce McCandless became the first human to float freely above Earth, completely untethered from a space shuttle. He was using the Manned Maneuvering Unit, or MMU, a nitrogen-powered jetpack that allowed astronauts to move independently in space. It was developed to allow astronauts to work outside the space shuttle, particularly to fly out and retrieve satellites for repair or return to Earth. This first use of the MMU took place during the STS-41B mission, which also deployed two satellites, Palapa B-2 and Westar-6. However, a failure in their kick motors left both satellites stranded in unusable low Earth orbits, about 600 miles above Earth. At the time, satellites were considered disposable once launched. They were never meant to come back for repairs. With a potential loss of nearly $200 million, NASA made the rare decision to send astronauts back into orbit to retrieve the satellites. NASA had already demonstrated on-orbit capture and repair of the Solar Maximum mission satellite earlier that year. During that mission, an astronaut using the MMU attempted to capture the satellite, but rebounded three times, and with limited nitrogen remaining, the attempt was aborted. The satellite was later secured using the shuttle's remote manipulator system, a robotic arm used to grapple and maneuver payloads. Unlike that mission, the Palapa and Westar satellites had no grapple fixtures compatible with the RMS, an astronaut would have to fly out, stabilize the satellites by hand, and carefully position them so the arm could take over. The mission was assigned to STS-51A. Not only were they to deploy two new satellites, but also to retrieve the failed ones already in orbit. The mission commenced on November 8, 1984, when the Space Shuttle Discovery launched from Kennedy Space Center. During the first few days of the mission, the crew successfully deployed two communication satellites. With these deployments complete, they turned their focus to retrieving the failed satellites. In the weeks prior to this mission, ground controllers lowered the orbits of both satellites from 600 miles to 210 miles to match Discovery's altitude and reduce their spin rate from 50 to 1 RPM, enabling capture by the shuttle astronauts. On the fifth day of the mission, Discovery was maneuvered to within 35 feet of the Palapa satellite. Astronauts Joseph Allen and Dale Gardner exited the airlock to begin the spacewalk. Allen strapped into the MMU and attached a device called the Stinger, a specially designed tool meant to lock into the satellite's engine nozzle. He then flew to Palapa. Mission specialist Joe Allen uh, on the uh, MMU with the Stinger attached to the front will fly around to the back end of the orbiter and uh, insert the Stinger into the rocket nozzle. The uh, Starting into it. But it's in an empty position. I close and rank's about right. Okay, I almost can't see it. I'm flying right into the sun. Okay. Okay, I'm penetrating. Goggles pull. Stop, doc. Stop, doc. Crank, crank, crank. It's pulling it right down. I'm using no gas at all. Allen cranking down a ratchet handle to tighten up the grip on the Palapa satellite. Even with the sun blinding him, he managed to insert the stinger into the spinning satellite's engine nozzle. For several seconds, both the astronaut and the satellite rotated together. He then activated the MMU's automatic altitude hold feature to stop the spin. Now Allen could maneuver the satellite, turning it as needed so the shuttle's robotic arm could grab the grapple feature. Once captured, the arm secured the satellite and maneuvered it into position above the payload bay. But there was a problem. A rigid section of Palapa's waveguide equipment extended farther than anticipated, preventing the adapter from fitting into place. Want me to tell him? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Houston uh, Discovery, we're gonna let Dale talk. We got a problem here. Roger, go ahead. Okay, Jerry. Okay, Jerry, here we go. The common racket clamp will not fit on the satellite. The problem is, between the two uh, octagons, between the two common bracket parts of the satellite, is a structure that's sticking out uh, far enough that it is hitting the cross brace of the common bracket clamp before I could get the, uh, the V-head bolts even close to driving onto the octagon. Okay, we copy it's that and understand. Each EVA suit carried only six hours of consumables, and the crew could not afford a prolonged debate. If the satellite was not secured before the clock ran out, 
the mission would lose its opportunity to complete the recovery. Ground controllers and the crew quickly agree to abandon the original plan and proceed with the backup. Allen repositioned himself in the contingency foot restraint, while the shuttle's robotic arm handed the satellite over to him. For the next 90 minutes, Allen physically supported the 1,200-pound satellite, holding it steady as Gardner worked alone to attach the adapter. Mission Control Houston, uh, Joe Allen now qualifies as the uh, first human in history to hold a 1,200-pound uh, communication satellite over his head for one trip around the world. The task had originally been designed as a two-person operation, but Gardner was now forced to wrestle the large adapter into place by himself. After carefully rotating the satellite by only a few degrees, Gardner found the correct alignment. He secured the adapter by manually tightening nine bolts, locking it into position. With the adapter finally seated, the satellite was rotated upright and slowly lowered into the payload bay where it was secured with retention latches. The spacewalk was completed in exactly six hours. Over the next two days, the crew serviced the spacesuits, conducted routine shuttle maintenance, and prepared for a second orbital approach, this time to retrieve Westar. On day seven, Allen and Gardner switched roles, with Gardner flying the MMU to capture the satellite. Westar's waveguide equipment protruded in the same way as Palapa's, meaning the same clearance issue was expected. Using the MMU, Gardner flew out, inserted the stinger into Westar's engine nozzle, and stabilized the satellite. Allen secured his feet in a restraint mounted at the end of the shuttle's robotic arm. From there, he physically held the satellite as the arm carefully maneuvered both him and Westar toward the payload bay. Gardner then positioned the adapter. This time, it fit cleanly. After tightening the bolts, the satellite was rotated upright and lowered into the bay where it was locked into place. Use of discovery. Go ahead, discovery. Roger, we have two satellites latched in the bay. Roger, that uh, gave us a big cheer down here. Following its recovery, the astronauts humorously held up a for sale sign, jokingly suggesting the malfunctioning satellite was up for sale. The mission concluded with both satellites being carried back to Earth, refurbished and relaunched a few years later. But why would NASA spend billions of dollars? along with immense time and effort to recover satellites worth only a few hundred million each. It was never really about the money. They did it to show that it could be done. The manned maneuvering unit was never used again. After 1984, it was retired because the space shuttle's robotic arm and improved procedures made it largely unnecessary for satellite retrieval moving forward. To this day, it remains the only time humans have physically brought free-flying satellites back to Earth. <laughs>